Today in Across the Fence of Vermont, author and former teacher offers up his advice and observations on classroom teaching. We'll learn about notes to a new teacher and chalk dust memories. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Our guest this afternoon is a former high school science and journalism teacher. He spent most of his teaching career in the greater Boston area and was in teacher training programs at Harvard and Stanford. He now lives in Walden, Vermont, where he's a writer and an author. And he was with us back in 2004 to discuss his book on Howard Dean's campaign. It is a pleasure to welcome Dana Dunnan. Thanks for being with us. Nice to be here. And we should mention right off the bat that you taught at the high school I went to for two years. And I remember you. <laughs> Which is crazy. <laughs> well, I guess it's no surprise that you're a teacher. I mean, you moved around a lot. Your father was a teacher. He was a superintendent mm -hmm. most of my growing up, and uh, he would create enough difficulty in whatever community he moved into that after five years it was time to move on and be a change agent someplace else. Mm -hmm. And so you have other siblings who are teach? I have two brothers, both of whom went into education and were administrators ultimately. And so tell me about um, your education and some of the different places that it took you. Well, I went to high school in St. Paul, Minnesota at Highland Park uh, with a young man named Gary Sadowski. <laughs> and uh, got a good education there, went to UNH, uh, which I will always be grateful to for, uh, that's where I met my wife. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Stanford for my teacher training. And so tell me a little bit about why you decided to write these two books. I got a good education at, at Stanford and good teacher training, but there were a lot of things that I didn't learn about in that teacher training. And I thought in writing this, particularly uh, the first book, Notes to a New Teacher, that I could uh, tell uh, beginning teachers things that I wish I had known. Mm -hmm. And can you give me an example of what that might have been? One of the things new teachers need to know is that it's really crucial to pace yourself. Teaching is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And any time you spend sprinting, you're gonna have oxygen deprivation at some point later on for having done that. So over the course of a year, it's really important to pace yourself and save some time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I know this Chalk Dust Memories um, is to a more wider audience. Yeah, I wrote that uh, to m sort of make a bookend to the other book about my teaching career. Uh, after 26 years, I chose to leave teaching, and so Chalk Dust Memories uh, was written uh, to explain how the, the burning idealism that I started teaching with uh, translated into the... Uh, uh, embers of cynicism that I left <laughs> with when I was age 48. And I want to talk more about that, but first of all, you have uh, something you're going to show us? And it didn't work. <laughs> uh, if the can is heated hot enough and you have a steaming vapor coming out of it, when you turn it upside down, the condensation of the vapor inside the can will cause the can to collapse spectacularly. But the mm -hmm. key is to get, get it really hot. And mm -hmm. It took a while to get it here from the kitchen. And what's happening over here? This one is working much more effectively. Uh, and what happens here is the uh, hot vapor that was inside it uh, condenses as the can cools, and as the vapor inside condenses, the atmospheric pressure outside collapses the can. And so, is this some of the th th kinds of things that you would do in class with your students? Yeah, I like to have students write about uh, what they saw going on in demonstrations. And they would write, for example, about their observations of what they saw with mm -hmm. the can collapsing. And then they'd read them aloud and uh, go back and rewrite them. And then once we'd done that to a, a point where everybody was satisfied, then I'd ask them to try and write an explanation for what they, were, they thought was going on at the invisible molecular level. And through that, they could uh, gain ownership of a lot of really key concepts that otherwise would just be gibberish. And so you worked with some interesting people that helped shape your teaching, and one of them was a legendary college basketball coach. Tell us about that. John Wooden was probably the best men's college basketball coach ever. Uh, and not coincidentally, he was a wonderful human being. Um, he had a, an outstanding player, Bill Walton, who may have been the best college basketball player ever. And one season, when they were uh, starting the season uh, returning as a national championship, uh, Walton came to Coach Wooden and said that in spite of the rules, he really wanted to wear his hair long, and that was really important to him. And Wooden said, um, well, you know, I really respect your choice to do that and, and the strength of your conviction in doing that. And he said, and I want to wish you good luck, and it was great having you with the program. And the next day, a, a newly shorn Bill Walton came back and begged to be in the program. 
it's really important for teachers to try and anticipate what the impact of the discipline that they administer is going to be on someone. Uh, a second person that I got to talk to that was really neat was the, the sports writer Bob Ryan of the Boston Globe mm -hmm. and a commentator on ESPN. Uh, when I was teaching journalism, Ryan um, came to my class and he treated my students, kids just like you, with respect and uh, as if they were professional colleagues. And the students responded by writing an interview that won the National High School uh, Sports Writing Award in high school journalism. Uh, if, if you treat kids with high expectations and let them know that you believe that they can fulfill them, they will do that more often than not. And then Glenn Seaborg was the first scientist ever to have an element on the periodic table named after him while he was still alive. And I worked with Seaborg uh, to produce materials that were used around the world in high school chemistry classes. As a matter of fact, your tie is sort of an homage to that. <laughs> it is, very much so. Um, I like to wear a tie periodically. <laughs> I want to mention that because there's a lot of humor. You put a lot of footnotes in your book and there's a lot of humor tied to that. Why did you decide to do that? I think humor is a great coping mechanism, and if you don't have a sense of humor, uh, teaching's gonna be awful hard. I think reality is probably gonna be awfully hard. And so I, I tried to put the humor in there to, to make the book more readable, and the people who've read it so far seem to feel it, it is very readable. You know, a lot of people think that teachers have it pretty easy. You have the whole summer off, you have vacations at every holiday, but um, that's, the reality is very different from that. Tell me a little bit about um, your experience in, in the public school system. Well, you know, in terms of teacher ha teachers having it easy, I guess I would probably say bad teachers probably do have it easy. Uh, good teachers and great teachers, the amount of work they can do is limitless. Uh, and you, you can, there's always something more you can do. You can be going in before school starts to work on your bulletin board. You can be staying after to tutor kids. There's always something more to do. And for the teachers who are truly committed, teachers who are truly changing the lives of their students, it's grueling, exhausting. Can you give me some examples of that? I know that uh, you worked obviously at Masco, the high school that I went to. Um, well, I, I know that at the end of many school years, particularly when I was teaching journalism, which was really stressful, uh, that I would get to June and, and just be completely wiped out at the end of school. It would take me a couple weeks to recover mm -hmm. after school was over, and then I'd kind of uh, arise from a zombie-like state and, and return to normalcy. And, and then I'd spend the rest of the summer trying to prepare myself for September, including physically training to be strong enough. Now, um, what are some of the, the problems, do you think, with, with the school system? I mean, people always say, oh, um, pointing fingers of blame, but you, you say that there's a direct correlation to um, how effective a school can be and, and how it's funded. You know, there are a lot of things that could change in education, and, and a, a real cultural change is necessary in our country. But it, there's no question that money has an impact in education. Um, when I first taught, I taught at uh, wealthy high schools, uh, Woodside in Silicon Valley in California, and then Maskinamit was in a very wealthy district also. Mm -hmm. And I also did summer school at Phillips Exeter Academy, uh, a school that has incredible economic resources that dwarfs any public right. high school. Uh, for contrast, I sent my students on a student exchange to South Boston High School just after the busing crisis had finished. And it was staggering the difference in the level of resources that the students at South Boston had. And so, um, also too at Masconomit, I know there was something called ABC students, mm -hmm. another sort of social experiment, if you will. And can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, the ABC program would bring kids in from uh, away from Boston and, and the North Shore of Boston where we were, uh, and generally urban areas like New York, Newark, Cleveland, places like that. And they would bring them in and these kids would all live in a, a single house uh, that was bought for the program. And then they would, as much as they could, try to integrate into the community. And I think that was great for the community because when I was first there, it, it was a fairly lily white school mm -hmm. and so it was, it was good for the community to have the ki these kids there. I, I'm, I'm not sure how good it was for the kids to be trying to integrate like that. I think that we were asking 
something that's a great deal to ask of adolescents in integrating the community. But I loved having them there. Yeah, ABC stood for a better chance, right. thinking of the kids. But it, you know, it's like might as well just drop them on Mars in some cases. Absolutely, you know, it, it just. We were asking them to do things that's just not reasonable for 16 and 17 year old boys and, and putting them in a certain, every adolescent feels like the spotlight is on them. Mm -hmm. Those kids had to feel it more than anybody else in the school. Now you live in Walden and I, my notes say that the Walden hasn't yet passed a school budget for this year. Yeah, um, it's a very small town and there are real economic inefficiencies in having a small school. Uh, and if the town of Walden wants to have their own school and local control, they have to be willing to fund those economic inefficiencies. Um, but I, I think it's really important for the school. Ironically, the budgets would have passed in the ballot voting if all the parents had turned out to vote for it. But not just parents benefit, everybody in the communi community benefits from having a good school. But the thing about enlightened uh, self-interest is you have to have a degree of enlightenment. And to that extent, schools need to do a good job in their public relations. Mm -hmm. um, in some of your, in your chalk dust memories, mm -hmm. you take a lot of jabs at some people that you used to work with. You changed their names, but mm -hmm. you've really, you know, stirred things up. And was that beneficial to you? I mean, I guess there, there are politics in everything that you, you do, but in schools are no different. Right. And, you know, you ran into some issues as a teacher with um, people above you, people mm -hmm. like coworkers. Um, and tell me a little bit about how you sort of dealt with that. Uh, I wish I could say I dealt with it spectacularly well. <laughs> I'm not sure I did, but it made for a much better book, I think. Mm -hmm. Originally there were two books. Uh, there was one book and, and I ended up breaking into two because my goal all along has been to try and help beginning teachers. So as I started writing a singular book, uh, I thought, well, I need to talk about my experiences. And some of the experiences were pretty negative. And so rather than lay that out in front of somebody who's a pre-service teacher, I decided to separate them out into two books, one that's m completely memoir, and then the other book is really aimed at the beginning teacher. And so as a beginning teacher, you said, pace yourself. What other advice do you have for people who are going into the profession? Yeah, there's a lot of advice in the book. Uh, one of the things teachers find difficult uh, is discipline, and a couple the techniques that I learned came from my wife, who's a uh, very good speech pathologist in the Danville School. And that was uh, when kids start yelling at you, the thing to do is not yell back, because you probably could out yell them, but to speak very softly so that they end up trying to lean in and hear what you have to say, and you've lowered the, the intensity of the conversation, and you've also shown that you're in control, both of yourself and of the situation. A second thing I learned from my wife was uh, when a student is misbehaving, you can say to them, well, you have two choices, and then you carefully frame the choices so that you like pretty much both the results. But the student gets the illusion of uh, being in control of the situation because they're making a choice. Do you think that people uh, who are going into education are properly schooled in these kinds of areas to, to handle these kinds of situations because they come up day after day. I mean, you're dealing with how many kids a day? Yeah, 100 or more, yeah. certainly. I, I'm not sure there's any perfect training for that. You know, it's like trying to prepare somebody for combat. How can you really do that? Um, but I think the, the more teachers can be uh, presented with different situations and, and talk about how to deal with different situations, then the better they might be when they're on their toes. And, and that's part of what makes teaching so stressful is there's always going to be something new that you never anticipated. And I put several uh, anecdotes like that in the books. Uh, and then you have to try and do what's right. And afterwards, somebody can always say, you know, you really should have done that differently. Yeah, you know, looking back on it, I could have done it differently, but I had to do it on the spot. It's not unlike parenthood. <laughs> it, it's very much like parenthood, I think. Um, I, I think parents, have the most important job that there is. But I think that teachers can have an enormous impact on the lives of their students. I would have to agree with you there. Um, how can people find out about your book? Well, Books. Uh, they're both available on Amazon.com and I have a website called ChalkDustMemories.com and that has a great deal of information about the books. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. It was a lot of fun talking to you and great to see you it's again. It's good to see you again too. <laughs> Many years. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.
For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.